Okay, Miss Aaliyah Dahl, welcome to the Institute of Black Imagination. So excited to hop into this conversation today. It is going to be full of so many wonderful gems. So welcome. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me. I'm excited. So to start today off um, and to center ourselves, who would you like to dedicate today's conversation to? Oh, that's such a good way to start. Um, I'd really like to dedicate it to just all of the artists that I work with and have met along the way that have given me this knowledge and also continues to teach me as the years go by what it means to advocate for artists. And it's I'm just incredibly grateful and fortunate to be able to do what I do because I really love it. And there are other people who have jobs out there that they hate and they just do it to make money and come home and have to dedicate time to their hobbies or their, their interests. But I am very fortunate to not be able to do that and to just do what I love every day. So just, I guess everyone who's just um, influenced me on this journey and has been a part of it. Mm. Speaking of the journey, who is Aaliyah Dahl? <laughs> um, so I, that's, oh my gosh, where do we even start? Where do we even start? <laughs> uh, well, I'm originally from Chicago and I am one of those people who just knew very early on that I wanted to do something in art or something creative. I wasn't sure if that was in the direction of art or fashion, which is also one of my loves. Um, but I knew that being creative in some way was essential to me and something that I needed to be able to do every day. So originally, I thought that that meant being an artist. And so I took art classes and I really enjoyed that. But early on, I just I knew that I frankly wasn't going wasn't in the same place as some of the other students in my class in terms of they knew that they could not do anything else with their life or anything else in the world other than be an artist. And I knew I didn't have that. But mm. what I wanted to do was support those people who felt like there's nothing else in this world that they can do other than be an artist. So at the age of like, I don't know, 10 years old, I knew that. Um, how I would accomplish that, I had no idea, but I knew that that's what my goal was. And so I got my undergraduate degree in art history from U of I in downstate Illinois, which was very interesting, but not focused on the contemporary art world. My graduating class was 15 women that were primarily interested in historical art. Um, and I happened to learn about Sotheby's Institute. I don't even know how. I was looking at graduate programs, actually, and I knew I didn't want to get a um, master's degree in art history. I knew I wanted to focus on art that was being made of my time. Um, mm. And so I somehow found Sotheby's Institute and saw that they had programs in New York, London, and Los Angeles. And I didn't want to live abroad. So that crossed out London. I don't drive. So that crossed out LA. <laughs> so I was like, it was New York, I go. <laughs> and applied to the New York program. And I got in, and that really just changed the course of my life. Wow. And now you are the managing director of artists and exhibitions in New York at Jeffrey Deitch Gallery. Yes. How did this come to be? Like what what was your intro what was your introduction to Jeffrey? Um, and are you in the place that you saw yourself, you know, as that young mm. girl back in Chicago? Yeah, I, you know, what's so interesting is that I had never thought I would work at a gallery. I, mm. I just, I, I never thought I'd work at the gallery. Actually, when I applied to Sotheby's Institute, I thought I wanted to work at an auction house. And I worked at Sotheby's very briefly and very quickly realized that it was not the best fit for me. Um, mm. And so when applying to jobs, I, I was applying to um, public art. Um, public art uh, companies, and then just a, a lot of a lot of positions that were related to the art, but not directly working with artists, which is very fascinating given that that's what I do today. But um, 
I, one year after I, about a year after I graduated, I went to Armory Show and made the mistake of going to Armory Show about an hour before they were closing on one of the Vernissage days. So I miscalculated and thought that they closed an hour earlier. So essentially I had about an hour to see the entire fair and run around. But I had seen a New York Times profile of Jeffrey's booth which was at that time the Florence Setheimer collapsed time salon. And it was on the front cover of the art section. And so I knew that if I didn't see anything, I had to at least see this booth because it was absolutely incredible. It was a a version of a booth that he had done previously at, at, at a previous fair. And so I got to the booth and saw that Jeffrey was sitting there, which is incredibly rare for you to see an owner of a gallery sitting in their booth on the last hour of a vernissage day, like now working at the gallery as it gets later into the week, I am not sitting at the booth. I am going to see shows and um, maybe going, just walking around the fair. So to see that was, I just thought was absolutely incredible. And I went up to him and introduced myself and just said that, thank you for presenting this incredible presentation. And Jeffrey, to my astonishment, got up and started a conversation with me and it just so happened that he needed some help at the gallery um and it coincided with someone from his staff uh, deciding to go to grad school and leaving and um we continued the conversation a few months later but he essentially offered me the job and i was hired within the realm of being an administrative assistant but quickly saw that there were opportunities for me far beyond that in the gallery and really to work with artists. So the first really major show that I, the first show that I worked on was Alan Vega, who was formerly known, also known as Alan Suicide, um, which was a show that I worked on with my, my colleague, my colleagues at the gallery at the time. But I'd say that my first really big show was with Kenny Scharf which was an absolutely phenomenal experience and thrust me right into the world of, how to run a run a gallery and how to um, curate an exhibition and organize an exhibition of someone of Kenny's stature. Wow. Okay. There's so many amazing things in that story that I want to unpack. <laughs> first, <laughs> first, I want to um, what what is vernissage, right? For <laughs> yeah. for those of us listening, what are you talking? You keep talking about this vernissage day. What is what is vernissage? Yeah, I, I realize that that sounds it sounds like a made up word. Um, it probably is, but it is the it's a essentially a pre- a preview time slot where VIP clients are able to visit the fair unencumbered by the public, by the public audience. And so it's a little bit different than the VIP preview day. And this, we can get into the whole ecosystem of fairs, but our fairs essentially will give out tickets to certain time slots for certain people. So the first day of the fair, which is usually not even publicly advertised on on the website is a VIP day. And so that is usually a smaller group of people who are given tickets. They don't have to pay for the tickets. They're just given, given free tickets. And these are usually collectors, maybe they're museum staff um, and maybe press, but primarily just collectors. The second day is usually referred to as a vernissage, which can either be the second day or later in the day of the fair. And that is, a certain amount of time, usually later in the afternoon on either the the first or second day, where the second tier of important VIP clients or museum staff are able to come. And so it's not necessarily the super, super VIP people, but they're still very important, um, very important clients. However, usually owners or senior staff members of a gallery will stay for the first day and really I mean, if they are being very strategic with their time staying for just the first few hours and then they might leave and go back to the gallery um, if they have a gallery in the space where there's the fair or they might walk around with a client they it's not it's unusual for them to still be at the booth on that second day or later in the, in the day okay so the <laughs> Every, every time you speak, I have like 18,000 questions. Yeah. Um, but to, to go back earlier, you know, to 
to your encounter with Jeffrey, one, what I love about that story is the ways in which kind of timing and happenstance Mm. and like the internal stories in our head can kind of collide. I think so many times we think we are off track or that we made a mistake um, or, you know, we beat ourselves up for running late and not really knowing that it's actually a setup many times to lead you down like the path that you're actually after, right? So the ways in which life is really kind of co-creating with you um, at all times. And I I really love that about the story. But then as you speak about Vernissage and, you know, I'm I'm familiar and also to let listeners in uh, on today, today's actually a special episode for us. Um, We're really looking at um, the... Institute as a place of not only like learning about people's stories, but also like curriculum. So this is our curriculum episode and our teacher and our instructor today is the lovely Aaliyah Dahl. Um, So there's going to be, a so pull out your notepads um, and and get ready. There's a lot of information coming. Um, So yes, uh, I've gone to Vernissage days. I guess I'm 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 tier two. Uh, but as you speak about this system, even in art fairs, what about that structure do you find works and maybe doesn't work? Because you know, a big part of why we're here, a big part of what I think is incredible about our bodies in the art world is about representation and is about, you know, creating more access. But this Mm -hmm. system, right, even using the word vernissage, right, is really a way of separating, right? It's kind of a code and um, it's what people would call like a shibboleth. Um, And to, to, to inform readers, a shibboleth is, um, any kind of word or phrase that is kind of like a password, kind of like those who know, know. And it is um, derived uh, from the Jewish community. And it was a, it was a word that was mentioned um, and people would know whether or not you were part of a group because of the accent that you would use in saying this word. And so it's a password in. So things like a vernissage, right? That's a kind of a shibboleth of the art community. Yeah. But it's actually also meant to obfuscate, right? It's meant to lo- mm-hmm. not let people know what's going it's, on. And so, exactly. It's, no, it's supposed to be intentionally confusing so that people don't know what that is. So they're just like, you know what? I'll just go on a public day because I don't know what's going on here. So I'd rather <laughs> just stay later. <laughs> yeah. So, so to hop right into it, you know, what do artists, potential curators, and maybe even potential gallery owners need to know about sales and strategy in mm-hmm. the gallery and art space? Yeah. So I, I think first of all, my working from, uh, from the gallery perspective, or thinking from the gallery perspective, you are in service of the artist. Um, You are, as a gallery, given the opportunity to advocate for artists. And that can mean many different things. So from this, and within sales, that can mean literally financially giving funds to artists by selling their work, because this is their livelihood and you are... That is your responsibility. Another way of um, using or proceeding with that responsibility is to be very strategic with how you are selling. And so what I usually do with artists that I work with is that before every major exhibition or before a fair project or before we sell anything, we have a conversation on what is it that you would like to accomplish with this? And I will try to do my best to make that happen. Um, I, especially with an exhibition where there's a large body of work and even more, it's even more essential to do this when it's in, you're working with an artist who maybe has a long wait list of collectors who've wanted to buy their work for a long time or doesn't make that much work. So maybe this is the first body of work that the, that has been presented to the public in five, 10 years. You have to be very strategic with how you place the works. Um, that does not mean that we are 
snobs. And um, if someone is, walks into the gallery, that doesn't mean that they can't buy a work. But that it does mean that if you have 10 paintings and you have 100 people, there are going to be 90 people who are unhappy. So you have to be strategic with how you are selling the works. Um, but it really starts with that conversation with the artist on what is it that we want to accomplish with this with this goal or with the show. The goal might be to, to place the work with museums um, or to prioritize museums. Another goal might be to, if the show is in New York, to prioritize collectors on the East Coast because maybe they would like to, the artists would like to expand their audience on the East Coast. It might be on the West Coast, might it might be to place the works with Europe. It just, it takes just taking a beat and having that conversation with the artist so that everything is very clear and on the same page so that you do have a successful show, no matter what happens with sales. Interesting. Um, you know, I think I, I kind of want to almost take a step back mm -hmm. um, because, and, and I think, and I love that we actually opened this conversation with the art fair um, because I think a big issue, and it's been a topic that's been brought up in the art world, is the lack of access that Black collectors or collectors yeah. of color actually have to works, right? Mm -hmm. To actually purchasing works. Um, and then on the other side, you know, from an artist side, you know, the artist has goals, right? There are certain things that the artists themselves want to achieve. But I think for the lay person, which I include myself in the group of lay people, you know, in the art world, you come to an art fair or you, you know, you come to a show and everything's already sold out, mm. right? Yeah. Like everything's already sold out. Uh, mm. You have no access to any of these works. And so what we're really talking about here is this system actually that's at play, mm -hmm. right? The system of, you know, galleries and, and their, um, their goals, the artists and their goals. And then, um, the lay person, the, you know, the everyday um, art enthusiast. Um, yeah. So let's talk about the artist for a second. Um, in seeking representation at a gallery, right? Consider it, you know, an artist who may be self-taught or an artist, you know, who just mm -hmm. graduated from an MFA program. Like, what should they be thinking about because you spoke about goals right and kind of mm -hmm. being really clear about where you want to go and where your work goes but like how do we even how do we even get there like what 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 should an artist be thinking about as they look for gallery representation i think that's a great question and i would even take a further step back and start with what it is that with the artist thinking more about what it is that they want, period, before the representation conversa um, com conversation mm -hmm. comes in. Because working with the gallery and having the gallery represent you can be two very different things. And Double I think, tap on that. And I, yeah, I've found that a lot of, that there's this rush sometimes for artists to be represented by a gallery. And it's a rush that they have created because of competition and maybe conversations with other artists who are also um, just excited to have representation, but several artists that I've had conversations with who are sometimes are a little bit regretful of having a committed exclusive relationship with the gallery because they didn't necessarily take the time to think about what it is that they want. Because when mm. you are an artist and you're coming to a gallery, you should be able to, in an ideal world, come to them and say, this is what I want you to do for me because the gallery is in service to the artist. It's not the other way around. So the gallery is in service to the artist. And so the gallery is providing whatever the service to the artist that the artist wants, but the gallery really needs the direction from the artist. So sometimes if a gallerist is going to an MFA open studios and signs an artist at that stage when they are if, if the artist is very young and doesn't have experience, the relationship is made not in sometimes and not in necessarily favorable terms towards the artist because the artist has not taken the time to really think about what it is that they want. And to get even mm. more granular in that, 
I mean, do you want the gallery to have access to all of your inventory, period? Um, do you want, um, who do you want to sell your work to? Um, I mean, do you, are you selling your work? Um, so what is the, do, or do you need money? Like these are really just very basic questions that you need to think about because sometimes, um, there are, you just, you have to really just like take a beat and think about what it is that you, that you want to accomplish. But it, it starts with being, ref, taking a little time of reflection on where you are. So if you are an artist and you're not selling your work at all, um, a gallery can be very helpful in just selling work to make you money so that you can put that money back into your studio practice. Um, if you are an artist though, who has been selling their work, but you need a physical space to show your work, um, or you, want to if you have you don't have any collectors in Europe but you want to move to Europe eventually and um connect with curators there then those are that's where you can be a little bit more strategic with who you're working with if you want to expand your your presence in Europe then you should probably pursue a European gallery or a gallerist in you can pursue a gallerist in New York that maybe has European collection or European collect connections, but it would not be as strategic for you to pursue representation by a gallery that has no European connections at all, because they are mm. going to be very focused on something else that doesn't necessarily align with your goal. Um, not to say that the gallery can't help you, but these are just things that should be brought up and it has to be brought up from the galleries or from the artist's end because the gallery cannot read your mind. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, you've, you've gone to visit, you know, numerous artist studios, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. um, what are some of the maybe mistakes um, or not best practices that you've seen you know, with artists like in their studio and what kind of grounds that question is, I think a lot of times, you know, being a creative, being an artist, like you're just in the work, right? Like you're just trying to do your work. You're also, you know, sometimes maybe looking left and right and, you know, seeing your friends, but you know, you're, you're kind of in the dark, right? And there's this whole operations side to the art world as yeah, well. Um, and so, and 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 that's something that you know many people are not taught about in programs. It's not mm -hmm. information that's readily available. And so, what mm -hmm. are some of those maybe pitfalls and maybe even early pitfalls that an uh, that a young artist could that a young artist um, may be making and be completely unaware of that makes them you know unattractive to both the art world and you know the art market. I would, I mean, I think the first thing, going back to what we were talking about before, is just getting a real handle on what it is that you want and what it is that you want to accomplish with the gallery. Um, mm. And then secondary to that is doing your research. And it doesn't, I mean, mm. there's research that you can do online, but I mean, if there's a gallery that approaches you for representation, is it a gallery that you're familiar with? Do you know the owner? Do you know the staff? Have you been to the mm. gallery physically? Um, have you... Do you go to their openings? Who's at the openings? Um, have like, Walk up to the owner or the senior director who is at the opening and strike up a conversation with them. Introduce yourself. Um, I would, it's, it's really just you really, especially if the gallery has reached out to you, like there's sometimes galleries will receive um, DMs or introductions to artists, but really putting the face to the name helps. So I just, I would suggest just doing your research first. Um, mm. And then at that, after that, not the research in terms of the gallery, but also look at their program. Who are the other artists that the gallery represents? Are they your peers? Are they people that you've never heard of? That will make a difference in terms of if the galleries be, will be able to present your work in the context that you want. Um, so I think that that's valuable, but also just talking to other artists, like who, who just really, I would say to make a decision with your own, based on your own gut feeling, but it is valuable to lean on your community of artists and see 
what are their experiences working with the gallery? Does it has, does, do you know anyone who's worked with this gallery that is trying to pursue you? Um, so I think that, that those are all things that sometimes artists will rush into a relationship with the gallery without having done those things. And then sometimes it works out, but sometimes it doesn't. And that's where you get into these unfortunate, contentious relationships with galleries and artists. And I'm not saying that the artists are completely to blame. The galleries should be able to offer a service to the artist that is to the highest standard. But just speaking from the artist's perspective, that's what I would suggest to them. And, you know, in that, you know, and kind of even taking the gallery out of it, um, you know, I know many artists have have issues um, and challenges and even like pricing their work, right? Mm-hmm. I think that's something yeah. that's really big, especially if you don't have representation. Um, mm-hmm. You know, and I know it depends on the medium, but what are some things that artists should be thinking about in even just pricing their work, right? You know, people come in for studio visits. They want to quickly purchase something, right? Like, mm-hmm. do you sell it? Do you not? What do you sell it for? Yeah. Do you not want to yeah. like flood the market before a gallery comes? I like, know. you know, inventory, right? There are all of these small things that, you know, because you're you're an artist, you want to eat, right? Yes. And you're kind of in the <laughs> in-between. And I feel like mm. a lot of you know, being an artist is about kind of being in the in between, in between shows, in between mm-hmm. you know school and this. Like, like yeah. what are what are some of those things that artists should be thinking about? That's a that's a really great point, and I can only imagine being in the artist position when you have that studio visit, that one an early studio visit, and someone wants to buy your work, and you panic, and because someone wants to buy something that you were not maybe originally planning on selling. Um, well, in terms of pricing work you should see what other people of your with other artist friends are pricing their work that are similar works to yours. So if you're, if someone is making video work and you're making a painting, that's going to be very different. But if you're a painter, then who are, what are your, your friends selling their works for at that comparable size? And just keep in mind that it's not going to be, it it might not be perfect pricing at the beginning, but based off of what other artists are pricing their work and also cost of materials and time and effort. That is where you can come up with a general price that you can expand on. But I would always suggest, I mean, it also depends on your financial situation to be fair, very frank. If you can't make your rent or can't make your, your studio payments and you desperately need money, then maybe that is more of an incentive to be a a little bit more flexible on your discount policy than if you are not in that that type of financial situation. So it depends. There's just so many different factors that are involved in pricing at that early stage. But I would think about materials, what other people are are pricing their work at who are comparable um, or comparable within your community and the the financial aspect. Because you need, like you said, you need to eat. So I mm-hmm. wouldn't say don't sell something and then not eat. Mm-hmm. And and is there any kind of like rubric or formula that, so for instance, you know, an artist is saying, okay, I make a painting. This is how much the materials cost to make this painting. This is how much time and I come up with some number and then do I multiply that? Like, so for instance, right? Mm-hmm. Like I mostly work um, in you know, the fashion and like design space, right? And so there's kind Mm -hmm. of a formula of like materials and then there's like a wholesale price and then there's like a retail price, which is usually Mm -hmm. like double the wholesale price, right? Is is there any kind of like rubric like that in the art space that artists should be thinking about? That's a good question. There should be. There is, there really isn't. There, There is no like set rubric for that. It is a combination of, hearsay knowledge and trusting your gut. Um, I will <sighs> say if you are, which does it is like a non answer answer. <laughs> <laughs> um, I will say though, usually prices that I have seen coming out of a MFA program, if you are a painter and you're making medium size, small to medium size works, those paintings are priced 
no more than ten thousand, no more than five ten thousand in that range. Of course, I'm just throwing a number out there, so I don't want someone to think that like that's the price that I need to price my work. <laughs> but usually, it's around that that stage, maybe around the five thousand between five seven thousand dollar range. Um, but of course, it just depends on the financial situation, materials, and the price of the work for, I would be very interested to see your other friends who are making paintings, what are they selling their works for? Mm -hmm. Um, But this is, I I would also just, I would suggest to art, to artists at this stage, not to stress over this too much because you're just right at the beginning. And it's kind of like learning how to drive. The more you do it, the more experience you get, the better you'll get at it. And also the more individuals added within your community will continue to advise you and you'll get build these trusting relationships where you can ask, maybe you find a friend who works at a gallery and you can ask them for their opinion, or you have a friend who's a curator and you can ask them. So it's, it, it's this community building that is the most important, one of the most important parts at this stage, along with eating. <laughs> 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 Yeah. And I think also showing up, right? You mentioned, you know, making face-to-face connections. It's really interesting. Um, Even myself, I found, you know, when I was interested in art and and the art space, just showing up was just a big part of it, right? Because you begin to see the same people and the same faces. And about the second or third time you show up at the gallery, somebody's going to ask you, like, so... What do you do? Like, because they recognize yeah. your face, right? And exactly. so I think a lot of this is kind of just getting in, you know, and hopping in. But let's pivot yeah. over to the gallery side, the business okay. side. Because this for me is. Side. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Could you kind of set up the frame of how a gallery works? Mm-hmm. So. There are many different types of galleries. Um, There are, I think, to be very specific in terms of the gallery that I have the most experience with, um, galleries are usually physical spaces that are in various locations across the world. But the the galleries that are um, considered market leaders are usually in New York, Los Angeles, London, in Europe. The galleries can be in Paris, Brussels. those are the main art centers within Europe and the U.S. And then, of course, we can get into Asia with Hong Kong and Seoul. Um, but they're usually physical spaces. Um, they can range from small storefront space to a huge warehouse, um, a warehouse space. And the galleries are there to present artwork, really. That's what it comes down to. Um, Art, and the artwork can be varying from paintings, sculptures to performances. And galleries are there to work with artists collaboratively on an exhibition of their work, either within a solo exhibition context, meaning a one just one artist is showing their work, or a group exhibition context where it's a exhibition of multiple artists. And so galleries will get into a start a dialogue with an artist and work with them on that show and sometimes that will lead to representation sometimes it won't neither of those paths are bad or good it's just how it works out sometimes and then galleries will also work with artists on non-exhibition related projects and this can include performances or book projects or helping fund um museum Um, museum or institutional level exhibitions or institutional level artworks. So usually galleries are multifaceted, but it really, the first starting point is the exhibition, usually at the gallery's physical space. Mm -hmm. And like the business side of it, right? Like how Mm -hmm. is a gallery thinking about, you know, from the lens of the gallery, you know, shifting from the artist what is a gallery kind of after? Like, how is it mm. scanning, you know, the the world, right? The the world of artists. Um, how is it sustaining itself? What is the what are the gallery's goals? And and the reason I ask this mm. is because I think within any relationship, it's also really good to know 
what the other person in the relationship wants. Yeah. You know, what 100%. are they excited about? So could you explain a little bit about that? Yeah, I think that that's, I really appreciate the way that you frame that because that is part of the step for artists wondering, doing some reflection to see what it is that they want. But also it is good to know that what is the gallery getting out of this relationship? Because the gallery is getting a lot out of it too. Um, mm-hmm. So the gallery, of course, wants to, first and foremost, show the best artists working at the highest caliber to put these artists in the art historical canon. Um, The gallery has similar practical concerns as the artists in that they need a physical space to make work or to show work. So similar to artists needing the physical space to make work that can either be an external studio or they are making work within the confines of their home, you still need money to pay for that space. So galleries are in a similar position in that they need to maintain the physical space and it's it's a lot of money. Um, overhead costs mm. for galleries are very, very high, especially if you have a gallery in New York or Los Angeles or in Europe because you it's not like a kind of shady New York apartment where the floors can be slanted, the walls can be a little off and (laughs) you can just have one window. Like you, for a gallery space, you need to make sure that you have a level floor. You have walls that are plywood backed, mean so that you can hang heavy artworks on the wall. Um, It is ideal to have as much natural light as possible. So that means skylights or windows, usually skylights so that you're not obstructing wall space by having windows. Um, so to find a space like this in at New York, for example, is very challenging. Mm. And then on top of it, it would be ideal for the gallery to find a space in an area that's within a community of other galleries. So that similar to an artist building their own community of artists, um, galleries want to be within a community of other galleries. And so the gallery getting out of this is funds to continue to put back into gallery to continue to do this year after year. Um, So if you are, if uh, another thing too, is to have these relationships with artists that are just, you can't even put a price on that. Most people who are coming to work in the art industry do it because they really love art. Um, They're Mm. usually not, usually not doing it to make money. Um, if you wanted to make money, there are other industries that you could go into where it's a lot easier. Um, usually the people who are doing this are, are doing it because they're enthusiastic for art and want to be surrounded by these incredibly intelligent, creative minds all of the time. So there is some intrinsic, intrinsic value, but then there's also f- financial value that's coming from the gallery that the gallery gets in return for this relationship. Yeah, and you you mentioned earlier um, about you know the gallery wanting to one work with artists you know in the highest caliber um, in this time, but also putting them into the art historical canon. Mm-hmm. And I love that because that makes me want to talk about in the ecosystem mm-hmm. of the art world. Right, so we have an artist, we have galleries. We have museums, you know, we have curators. Um, What role historically has the gallery played in defining the art historical canon? That is such a great question. And I am not an expert in gallery history. However, I will say (laughs) that the gallery has, I mean, functioned is the first step in the art market recognizing an artist because usually the gallery is the first place where an artist is showing their work usually an artist is not directly going to a museum or a foundation they're starting at a gallery so the gallery is really setting working collaboratively collaboratively with the artist to set the stage uh, and set the foundation for the career to continue to build and climb Mm-hmm. Um, and so that can be the first and foremost, selling the work to collectors um, so that the artist has money to continue to make work. And then additionally, it is building an audience for the artist and building the market. 
And so that, that's a very vague term, but that more specifically means that you are selling the works to collectors to create a domino effect where maybe the collector tells another collector about the artist. Maybe the collector will invite other collectors to their home to see the work. Maybe the collector that you sell to is on the board of a museum who has a, a dialogue with museum curators and would like to introduce that artist to the museum curator so that the work is on their radar. So it's this domino effect that is happening that, of course, first starts with the artist, but then very quickly after the artist comes the gallery that is the physical space to present the work. Because an, an important thing to keep in mind is that people, usually the artists that I work with, they're making works to be seen and viewed in person. I know that we have Instagram, social media. I find and discover a lot of artists on Instagram, but it's not the same as seeing the work in person. So mm. there's a magic that happens when you actually place a sculpture in a, in a room that's unencumbered or you hang a painting on the wall that is, is very different than what you might find on social media. So um, the gallery just really like, sets this foundation and this bedrock that can then continue to be built on with other gallerists, with the artists themselves, and then also museums, books, all of these other things. And, you know, there's been a lot of conversation, you know, really over the years. Obviously, you know, during the racial reckoning of 2020, which was like, I don't know, version 87 that we've had in this country um, yes. about, <laughs> right, like, you know, representation. And again, you know, I mentioned earlier access, particularly from a collector side, you know, curators mm -hmm. of color. So with the gallery serving as this really pivotal um, interlocutor, right, like this, this translator, um, this linchpin um, in the art world, what historically has, have galleries not done? particularly for artists of color that have created this space of underrepresentation in the art world? That's a great question. Well, historically, and this is a, a lot of this has changed very recently as we can definitely get into too, which is very fascinating. But for a long time, artists of color were not recognized as artists that had the same prestige or same caliber as other artists that as white artists and so galleries um galleries are incentivized to focus on the best artists working at that time so if the consensus at that time is that the best artists working at that time are white artists then that is sometimes how the gallery will gravitate um and so I think that historically that was what well, that's what was happening for several years and several decades. But a change has really shifted the past five, ten, maybe fifteen years, where so many artists of color are now being recognized as artists who are worthy of being able to be shown on gallery walls. Another thing to keep in mind is that there are several gallery owners and ga people who are founding galleries were not art were not people of color. Mm -hmm. And so it's been a very recent change where there are black gallery owners and black, I mean, before even black gallery owners, black gallery staff members there. If you go into a gallery now you see more, but there were very few up until about 10, 15, maybe even 20 years ago. I think even 20 is being generous well, 10, 15 years ago. Um, and even fewer museum staff members that were uh, people of color. So if there's no one on the inside advocating for these artists, that makes it even more challenging to, for artists to enter, to get past this barrier. Mm, mm. Um, and I, I, I love that you mentioned uh, <laughs> social media uh, as mm -hmm. well. Um, you know, and I think sometimes we think that just like showing the work like online, you know, is a, is enough. Um, but there's, there's something to, you know, witnessing the work in person. Um, what are some of the other pitfalls that you see young artists making, particularly, you know, in survival mode? Cause I find mm. a lot of artists are in like that survival mode. 
That's a good question. And I will say that Instagram is a very powerful tool now and has become okay. very powerful and that it's not all bad. It's, it's actually mm-hmm, very mm-hmm, helpful mm-hmm. in discovering artists. It, it seems, and, and this is me speaking on behalf of artists, so I don't want to over speak and I'm curious as to your thoughts on it. It seems like it's a powerful tool for artists to take agency over their careers and market themselves independently of a gallery. Um, mm-hmm. So that has been, I think, great things about great takeaways from from instagram specifically um Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. however ultimately people still want to see works in person there's only so Mm -hmm. much that an online high-res tiff file or jpeg image can do Mm. so and i would not suggest that you as an artist are exclusively showing the work online it is if you are making work that should be viewed in person so Mm -hmm. it's ultimately important for you to establish a relationship with the galleries relationship being different than like saying that you want to be represented by them um if you want to be represented by them that's great but have a relationship with the gallery do a show so that the work can be viewed in person and i would definitely suggest pursuing that um and Another thing that I've witnessed artists doing sometimes is focusing, just rushing into this gallery relationship without just taking it very slowly. And by that meaning, Mm. do a show, just do a single show, see how it works out. You, you should take the time to see if you like working with the gallery and if the gallery likes working with you, because sometimes it's, not as smooth of a relationship as you would hope and you get what you want out of that single project and then you move on or at the very Mm. least it can give you the opportunity to see what the gallery strengths are and what it is that you like and don't like to bring to another gallery relationship in an ideal world you do the show with the gallery and it works out well and you love the your the owner and your artist liaison or whoever it is that you're working with and you want to continue in that relationship but it's important to just start with that first show even doing giving a work for a group show just to see how if you like working with them and if they like working with you before committing to this long-term exclusive relationship yeah and you and you mentioned like uh, go slow um, mm-hmm. I want to I want to kind of ground us in like the timing of these things because I I, I find yeah. that many people don't know that you know Shows are scheduled years in advance. Years in advance. You know, so yeah. if someone's able to like break through and get on your radar and they, you love their work, you know, they love what you all do, there's still going to be a gap there before be a gap. that show happens. Yeah. And ranging from a few months to up to a year. And of course, this is within discussion of the artist to see how long it will take them to make a whole show, because that's not something that you can just whip out very quickly. So, Mm -hmm. um, but it's, it's, I mean, sometimes it can be a year dialogue that you're having with, with, with the artist. And because it's, let's say that it's March right now, the show is March is a year from now. That's March. Um, the work needs to be done by March. So, or by March 24th or whatever day we can use. Um, so the works need to be ready to ship two to three weeks before then, depending on where they're coming from. And then another few months before then you need to send out a press release and, um, detailing this des- description of the, the exhibition to press. And you're also sending out an exhibition announcement. So even though you are, the show is a year from, from then you are working very critically on the show with the gallery in terms of exhibition management, at least four months before in terms of exhibition related material, but you're continuing a dialogue with the art, with the gallery and with the artist that entire time. So you're, doing studio visits, you're checking in to see the, what the body of work is that they're thinking of creating, you're going through logistics. So if the gallery um, only has walls that are 12 feet high and you want to make a painting that's 15 feet high, it's not going to work. 
for this gallery <laughs> space. So, um, or if the doorway is 40 inches and you want to bring in a sculpture that's 60, it's not going to work <laughs> either for this particular exhibition. So um, you are, these are all things, conversations that you're having that are, you're building trust. It's, it's like any relationship that you have. Like you very rarely will jump into a marriage with someone without mm-hmm, going on a mm-hmm. few dates, spending mm. some time with them, seeing how it works. Because it's very much a relationship. And the most successful relationships are those that are built over going slow and just spending time with each other to see if it's going to work out. Mm, And hopefully it does. mm. I mean, I have so many amazing artists that I work with. And it's because it's relationships that have just been built over years. So now we have a dialogue where we're on the same page. I know I present things to the artists. They approve it. And it's because we've been working together so long that I understand what it is that they want and they can depend on me to get things done that they want the gallery to get done. Mm, Speaking of relationships, you got married in 2021. Yeah, I did. Congratulations. Thank you. Congratulations. Um, You know, kind of in thinking about relationships and relationships that grow slow over time, how has love informed the way in which you view the world and the work that you're doing? Ooh, like love, my, my love? <laughs> love, 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 yeah, romantic love oh. and, and love in this art space. Hmm. I mean, it's at the, the center of, it's at the center of my purpose for what I do. I mm. absolutely love art. And even when I'm, on vacation and am at a beachside resort, I will still see if there is a museum or a gallery <laughs> nearby to, to go and see. And I will still see if there are artists to visit. So it's absolutely at the center of why I do what I do. And um, I'm just incredibly fortunate to still go to a museum opening or get a walk or participate in a walkthrough for an exhibition and am absolutely blown away because I just, I love art and Mm. just constantly amazed at what, um, what is able to be physically embodied or what artists are able to physically embody in in objects and and into work. Um, So it's really at the center and some, it's not always easy. You can be in some challenging situations, uh, but ultimately it comes back to loving what I do. And it's actually funny because on, on TikTok, I saw that Quentin Tarantino does this thing where, and this is off topic, but I thought you think you might find it interesting. Quentin Tarantino does this thing where they will take multiple takes of certain scenes, even when they have it perfectly right. And they, um, everyone on the set will say, chant it's because we love making movies or we love making films something like that Mm. and so even though they got the shot perfectly they just want to do it again just because they love being there and love is at the center of why they are even within that industry and i think that that really embodies why i do what i do and so many of my colleagues do what we do and (sighs) jeffrey especially yeah, this is I, I I love I love speaking of love. Um yeah, I, I love this because what I think is really being built, you know, even over this conversation is really this ecosystem, right? Um, you know, one speaking about the gallery and your work and you know, being at Sotheby's and um, you know, Jeffrey Deitch, your own personal relationship, your relationship with the artist, the lens that the artist should have when looking at gallery mm-hmm. representation. I think this really shows that you know, I think when we think about art and artists, like we think of like the solo artist, like feverishly working, you know, in the studio, but this is much larger than that, right? So, mm-hmm. you know, I think from like the layperson's perspective, really understanding that, you know, art is work as well, right? Like it is, you know, the making is one part, but there are mm-hmm. all of these other things that it takes in order to bring art into you know, the public sphere, yeah. but then also it's driven by this passion on both sides, right? That the artist must love what they're doing and love the space that they're in. And that works as well 
on the gallery side as well, but kind of focusing back on yourself and your specific role in the art market. Mm -hmm. Um, and in the world of art, um, you graduated, you know, again, with your master's from Sotheby's um, and you had a final project that focused on art, e-commerce and virtual reality. Yes. What did you learn at Sotheby's that has proven essential to the work you're doing in the art world and as a curator? That's a great question. I think it's not necessary. I can't equate it necessarily to a lesson or to a mm. specific class that I took, but the, what I really, it was the most important thing that I took away from the program were, was the community aspect. Um, mm. I moved to New York and I knew very few people. I can count on one hand how many people I, I met. So in grad school, those are still, several of my friends are, were, are still from the Sotheby's Institute program. But it really hammered home to me how important um, relationships are. And that's a lesson that I've learned time and time again, that it's all about relationships, both from the mm. artists and meeting new artists through other artists, um, but also collectors, curators, and cultivating and maintaining relationships is really the most important thing. And that comes from Sotheby's Institute and having these relationships that I still utilize today. Um, one of my friends is works at a major auction house and I will ask her her opinion on um, on certain works that are coming to auction. I had another friend that worked for a photo studio and I would ask their opinion on photo shoots and to get some advice. So just relying upon those relationships and maintaining them is really essential. Mm. And what do you think, you know, some of these art programs are not teaching that mm. they should? So my program was not artist focused. It was more about the business side of art it's because I got my master's in art business. So in the, if we're talking about that versus M the MFA program, I think that, um, that's a good question. I, I mean, the, the realities of what, when you're in grad school and you're graduating, looking for those first few positions, I think that it's not emphasized as much the realities of the financial pressure that you might find yourself in and the financial mm. aspect. Because when you, I was not in a position where I was, I had other income streams or I had a safety net. Um, so I had to make it work. But there are, because of the level of wealth in the art world and people who are the level of wealth that is attracted to the art world, there are people who are both within the ecosystem or within the gallery e ecosystem that are in a financial position where they don't really need the job. They, mm. and so that in turn will sometimes influence salaries and influence the, the compensation. So that is not, that, that is something that I wish that, um, programs that are focused on art business are emphasizing because that is directly correlated to the students when they graduate and that you will, it's similar to artists and that you're going to be struggling financially for a little bit until you start to make a little bit of money. Um, on the MFA program from just from my observations, there there just need to be some business lessons there. I mean, I don't know what what what, what are those business is lessons? Just like, yeah, absolutely. What are those business yeah. lessons? <laughs> I mean, how to do your taxes? How to um, like how to review a contract, meaning like a consignment agreement? Um, mm -hmm. What splits are like? What is a split with a gallery? Um, what is a split? What is a discount? A split meaning if you are selling a work of art with a gallery. Um, as an artist, you are usually getting 50% artist proceeds and then 50% will go to a gallery. Now, that percentage can change slightly depending on if there are production costs that need to be within the work, but the artist always gets 50%. Um, that 50% though will change if there's a discount given to the work, which in the art world is very standard collector discount is 10%. And sometimes you'll get larger percentages if you're selling your work to a museum, but a collector's discount is 10%. So 
having seen this breakdown in an Excel spreadsheet and being able to understand that and compare it against what was signed within the contract is a very important skill that I have not seen masters or art masters programs teach artists. And Mm -hmm. you are with us talking before about galleries being this creating working with the with the artist to create this foundation that is then built upon you are going from grad school and entering into a gallery relationship and if you don't have these skills and this experience and knowledge then you might find yourself in a situation where a gallery is taking advantage of you or Mm. you are not in charge of your money and as an artist you are a you are the owner of your own business the business being mm. making art. So you should be hopefully treating it as such because this is your business. You need to make sure that you have your taxes on point, that you understand what money is coming in and out. And it is not helpful for you to completely rely upon someone else to do this, especially a gallery where the gallery is doing this every day and they're and galleries have the responsibility to be as upfront with the artist as possible, but it's ultimately your work and your business and your life and your money. So I always suggest to um, ha- keep your own records and to uh, really understand the business aspect because it will directly affect your life. Mm. Um, and, you know, kind of speaking about, you know, business contracts, agreements, um, and also your um, interest in, you know, e-commerce and virtual reality even. Um, what can, you know, artists and emerging artists learn from, <laughs> this is, it, it almost sounds even dated to mention it, but I feel like it's not done yet. Um, the rise of like NFTs and the metaverse, right? Like mm. how is that changing the art world? That is, that's such a good question. And I am still trying to understand it. Um, I, there was this crazy rush of NFTs and art, um, what was it last year, a few years ago. Mm -hmm, And mm -hmm, mm -hmm. it seems that the way that it will be the most helpful is creating a, a way of, um, a, a way to connect performance work and video work and work that is not physical and give it a you an ability to track that work over a long period of time through for provenance. Um, the way that it is being used now as NFTs, I don't I don't see it as the way that it will actually be helpful for the art world long term. But it is a mystery. I mean, I'm very curious as to what happens. I'm sure when social media hit the hit the art world, that was a huge change and that was mysterious weren't really sure on how that was going to have an impact. So with NFTs, I, I feel like we haven't hit the point in which it's actually very helpful to, mm. to artists. I'm not exactly mm. sure what that will be, but I, it doesn't seem like it's hit, hit that point yet. But there is, I, I think maybe like in the digital contracting, I think it's mm-hmm. you know helpful because I think a big question we've been having you know in the art market is really about like resale and an artist having yeah. no yeah, part right of resale whereas with you know nfts um and things that are on the blockchain it can actually be in the digital contract that every time this piece is sold for you know in perpetuity the artist or the artist's estate um, or their family will receive something you know and i find like it's it's things like this in the art world that make it really ripe for innovation yes. um there are so many systems at play that um we've you know <laughs> we've just been doing it this way and so we're just going to keep doing it this way and artists i find many times you know suffer you know on the yeah. on the on the back end of that um but I also find it interesting that as as much as you were in, you know, kind of tech and virtual reality, you also have this really keen interest in clay and ceramics. Um, yes. And you curated an exhibition, Clay Pop, um, in 2021. Could you explain a bit about where you see, you know, ceramics in a contemporary context, right? Like this is one of our oldest 
if not the oldest art forms, right? As as a, yeah. as a species of people, right? Um, and so in 2023, like what, how are you viewing this medium and what are you seeing um, in the landscape? I'm so glad that you brought that up because I, I just going back to love, the idea of love and why I do what I do is um, just simply seeing how I mean, clay has been around for hundreds of thousands of years. And to see that artists are using this material that you can simultaneously use to make bricks, to build a house, you can use it to make a sink, and (laughs) to use it in a way where you're creating fine art is absolutely just mind-blowing to me. And a few years ago, I noticed artists of a younger generation working in this medium in, in a time where the predominant medium in the art world I observed was paint, figurative paintings. And so to see artists moving in a different direction and focusing on this, on this material that has been around for so many years, it's not an artist-made material. It's an industrial material. Paint paintbrushes, those are artists, those are materials made for the purpose of making our work. Clay is not mm-hmm. made for them made in that same with that same purpose um that was what originally drew me to discover more artists and to think critically and meet artists to see what it is that they were why it is that they were attracted to this medium and several conversations that started with artists were that they were drawn to the medium from different art practices so one artist um sharif farag was um was drawn to art through drawing um, another artist that I work with, uh, Alake Schilling, um, was a painter for her entire, was made paintings for most of her art career and happened upon clay through a, um, through Laura Owens, who's also a painter. So mm. it's just fascinating that clay will bring so many different people of different backgrounds. And it is a material that seems easy but it's actually very difficult that's also fascinated me Mm. it seems like you just like throw something together and you can be very spontaneous and there is an aspect to making a clay sculpture that is very spontaneous but you have to be part engineer part scientist and part fine artist in order to make a successful ceramic so Mm. part engineer meaning you are physically building something so you are um thinking about um, composition, but also scale and weight, and um, how if you have a kiln, which is the um, equipment that you use to actually fire and to finalize the work in its final form, if the kiln is a certain um, a, a certain dimension, then that is you have to create a work that's within that dimension. But thinking creatively on what is it that mm. you can make that is still exciting, but within these specific dimensions. Um, scientists, meaning you are, when you are glazing a work, meaning it's, it's essentially a form of painting a ceramic, uh, a ceramic work, glazes, the, the way that you are looking at glazes with your eye does not necessarily correspond to the way that the glaze will come out when it is in the kiln. Meaning the glaze might, as you're painting it in real life, it might look pink. And then when it comes out of the kiln, it is a bright green. So when scientists, you're really experimenting with glazes in these materials to see what happens when you put a work into a kiln. And then fine artists is that having the ability to create physically with your hands and have full creative expression um, with this material. And really the sky is the limit with what you're able to make. So using all of these different parts of your brain is just different than when you're making a when you're making a painting and um all of the artists within this community that i found with clay pop are all doing something completely different and the only Mm. connection is this material so i think that that's i thought that that was incredibly fascinating and similar to what pop artists were doing um is using everyday material to create something that is very new and fresh all of these artists within this community are doing something very similar Mm. Okay. I'm, and I'm, I'm as as you're speaking. First of all, I was getting a little bit of um, agita because <laughs> I, I I took a clay um, 
Oh, you course, did? Uh, last semester, yeah. Um, it's called Material Systems and Fabrication, which looked at um, clay um, as a medium of additive manufacturing, 3D printing, and robotics. Mm, so we were actually oh, 3D printing um, clay objects. And the glaze story just took me out. I was like, girl, I know. <laughs> I, paint, I put it on there one color. It came out green. I, I still like the green, but... <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's a lot of... It is, it is constant you don't experimentation. Have the same, so much experimentation and the loss of control, which as mm-hmm. an artist, and I'm curious as to your thoughts on this, so much about what you're creating is about how you're able to manipulate and control. So to relinquish that control is a humbling experience, but also creates this uh, opening for freedom and mm-hmm. a little bit of like, I guess we'll just see what happens. And um, with the glazing too, I mean, glaze not only can change a color, it can melt off, it can run into another color that you did not mean it to run into. It's that you don't have that same level of control. So you have to really release any preconceived notions that you're coming into the work and just let the work tell you what it is that it wants, how it wants to behave and how it wants to exist in the world. Yeah, there's a lot of pre-planning with mm-hmm. with clay, right? Because, I mean, and it's extremely formulaic and it's science. I mean, mm-hmm. a lot of the glazes are toxic, actually. Um, yes. And you are doing real chemistry, um, mm-hmm. you know, in the studio when you have all of the buckets of, you know, borite and like all of these crazy minerals. Um, yeah. that, and, it's, and it's also kind of magical because it really, it becomes glass, right? Like this glaze mm-hmm. is actually kind of glass. Anyway, let me not get into <laughs> all of this. <laughs> um, but, you know, I, I love this conversation. I feel like we've really kind of hit many different aspects of kind of like the art world and the art market. But, you know, want to bring the creative back into the center. And we have such a gift of even having you here because you are the other side, right? Like you're the business side. And mm-hmm. so, uh, you know, as we kind of hit the denouement another another french word uh which which means after the climax um usually in a play um so you enter an artist studio what are the things you're looking at looking for mm. and thinking about Oh, that's a great question. Well, first, of course, the work. That is what I'm immediately looking at as soon as I walk in. But I'm also personally just curious as to what the artist have, has in their studio. Just random things. Mm. Like, I am looking at their bookshelf. So what books are they looking at? What books are they referring to? Um, I also weirdly am curious about the food situation. So if there's like a toaster oven or a hot <sighs> pot. Um, I just, I'm curious as to like how, how they live and all, because all of this goes into, goes into the work. Um, but I think the books are the most fascinating to me aside from the work because so artists are influenced by other artists. Um, and so to see what they're referencing is, is always really fascinating. And I, we actually are coming out with a book. Uh, for clay pop with Rizzoli. And so some of the recent studio visits I've done are with ceramic artists and so I'll bring them a book. And I'm just so happy that the book will be added to their collection and maybe someone else will come in and, and see that they're in the clay pop book and just continue to create this relationship and also this domino effect within um, within their world. Yeah, and the reason I ask is because, you know, the studio visit or, you know, it feels so heavy, you know, sometimes, right? Mm. You come with all these expectations. And, you know, I think it's also about like, you know, as an artist in a studio, like, what is, what is a gallery going to be looking for right oh, like what yeah. what level of work are they going to be looking for May, maybe as an artist I'm not at a place where I'm ready for studio visits because there's work that I need to do mm-hmm. or there's a little bit more research there's a little bit more referencing there's a little you know I have more work to do on my end before I invite yeah. you know someone into this sacred space so just kind of knowing what galleries are even looking at and looking for even beyond just the work you know is super super helpful yeah I, I mean 
some in terms of questions and things that I'm asking, and my goal is just to better understand the work on a holistic level. So there's the mm-hmm. physical work that I'm observing, but also I want to have a conversation with you to see why you're making work. What is your background? How did you, what brought you to this body of work that you're making now? What are you thinking about in the future? What are you excited about in the future? Um, and to just keep the conversation just very casual. Um, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I am also interested in like what influences you, both art and non-art. Are you influenced by movies, books? Um, what are what are what have you watched recently that you really love? That you or what, what did you what have you seen recently that really influenced you? There are artists that I have done studio visits with where. They show me the work that they're making and then they there's this new material that they're like, yeah, you know, I got this new material. I don't really know what I'm going to do with it yet, but I'm going to just start working on it. And then years later, I see masterpieces that they're making with that one material mm. that they casually mentioned that they just happen to start working with. So it's just to kind of get a sense of, from the gallery's perspective, coming in just to get a sense of where, what are you making now? What are you excited about? What are you experimenting with? And um, this is, it, it's not a, usually it's not a one-off studio visit. I want to continue to visit with you over time and see what you're working on and for you to keep me informed on your work. But it's, it's just, the, uh, I would say it shouldn't be as much pressure as you just described. It mm-hmm. should just be more, you just being able to have an audience to discuss your work and to discuss who you are and a little bit of your background. And it should not just be, hopefully it's a, it's a setup where you're not just like talking at whoever came from the gallery. It should be more of a conversation. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and kind of speaking of, of experimentation, because I think that's such a big part of all of this for, for all stakeholders involved. Um, what, are some of the lessons that failure has taught you? Mm. Or could you even double tap on a specific instance and you were just like, oh, okay. Okay. (laughs) Um, Well, early on, uh, that first show with Kenny Sharp was the biggest learning curve I have ever had in my life. Mm. Um working with a, an artist as prolific and as important as Kenny, um, while also working on an exhibition at a gallery. And I had never worked at a gallery before. So there were so many lessons that I learned there, but in, there were so many things that I messed up. Like I messed up a checklist and I had to redo it. There was a, a work that was not on the list of works that was shipped. And I remember running to the gallery mm. that morning and just being so stressed out because I thought a work was missing or a new painting was added that I had no idea. Um, and I, but so a lot of little things like that, that just kind of chip away at you. Um, but what I did learn from that is to just, slow down and over prepare. So now I triple quadruple check everything that is sent out when it is going to be public facing or um, something that is really important that requires you to really just sit in silence and review. So consignment agreements, um, any sort of sales offerings, I am very precise with how I review those before they go out. Um, And to over-prepare because I feel more comfortable when I over-prepare. I don't feel comfortable and don't feel confident and can't confidently speak about work or advocate for the artist when I am in a frazzled space. Um, Mm. I also, this is not to do directly with the gallery, but I just try and take care of myself and take care of my own mental health. That is a very underrated thing that people don't talk about, but um, life can just run you ragged it can really just like throw you for a loop. So I make sure that I take a day, at least one day off. Um, and I might still go to a museum or go see a show, but I take one day off, I get a workout in, I make sure I get some sleep. Mm. Those are all things that will make me feel more confident and ultimately make me, make me do my job better. Because if I am not in a good mental place and I haven't slept and I haven't done something for me and done something for my own health and mental health, then I won't, 
I'm just not functioning at my highest level. And that will in turn affect what it is that I'm doing for an artist. Mm. Mm. I, I, I love, I love that it starts with self, you know, yeah, it starts with it really, really like number one, number one. Yeah. Um, you know, what are you most excited about right now? Um, well, I am super excited about Kennedy's exhibition, which is how we started about talking about this podcast. Um, yes. Uh, so the New York, we have a absolutely spectacular exhibition of the New York-based artist Kennedy Yonko in our Rooster Street Gallery in New York that is up for about the next month. And um, so we have that in New York. And then I am curating a, another version of Clay Pop in Los Angeles this summer in our um, new Los Angeles gallery. So. All of these incredible artists that I mentioned are going to be in the show with a couple of new faces. And this coincides with our a book that is being published by Rizzoli that will be available in the next few weeks. That is a um, one of my most special projects that I've ever worked on. Oh, well, that's amazing. We will have to definitely put a link up to all of this in yes, the show please. notes. Um, I hope I get a chance to make it out to Clay Pop in Los Angeles. Yes. Um, and, you know, in, in, in doing even some research and thinking about, like, you know, the public, you mentioned something really specific where you said, like, I triple and quadruple check everything particularly um, if it's going to be public facing. Um, yes. But you as an individual aren't actually quite public facing. Um, mm. You know, there isn't a lot uh, about like Aaliyah out in the world. How do you oh. view <laughs> your relationship to, right, like public versus kind of holding on to one's private mm. self? That is a great question. Well, it's actually funny that you say that because even though a lo- th- there isn't a lot that exists of me in the internet, I do feel like I am very public facing most of the time. Absolutely. My love of art is not independent of work. And so when it, what I say sometimes is that my passion is art, but art is also my job. So it means that I'm there are several times that I'm not working, but then it also means that I'm working all the time. Um, mm. So when I go to a museum or go to a gallery, they're usually people I'm running into. Um, there are also times where, like I said before, if I'm on vacation, I'm probably going to go see a show. I'm going to go visit artists. And so that, part of my life is very public facing. Um, But I just try to embrace it. I Mm -hmm. try to embrace it by also just trying to just be myself um, Mm. and be honest about what my needs are. If I need to take a break, I need to step back or have a day where I need to be antisocial and just watch TV Mm. all day. Um, We all have those days, but Mm -hmm. I I, I try to, to keep a balance, but also just trying to embrace just being myself and being the imperfect self that I am. Mm. And so mm. how that manifests itself online, we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> but I do feel like most of my life is public facing because I work with a lot of artists and I'm, I'm in the business. I mean, that, that's a big benefit about being in this world is that I do know um, prominent people and I can sometimes sneak into a museum early or come in late or get a private walkthrough with an artist. So um, I'm, I'm ha- most of the time I'm happy about it. There are just some times where I need a little break, but everyone does. Everyone does. Yeah. And, and to be, I should have framed it and asked if that was deliberate. Right. And, and that's oh, really from okay. an online presence. Right. Versus, I mean, yes. obviously you're out, you're out mm-hmm. here in these streets, which is how we. I am, a, yes, <laughs> in these streets. I am. Um, it isn't necessarily deliberate. It's just kind of how it's worked out now. But I yeah. do feel like there probably will be more of an online presence. I think as mm. with curating exhibitions like Clay Pop and working or having the opportunity to work with artists um, of a high caliber, like Kennedy 
with Kennedy's exhibition, there will be more of me, I think, online, but it just comes with time. And it also just comes yeah. with um, just, I, I've now been working with Jeffrey for five years at least. I don't mm-hmm, know if my math mm-hmm, is, is mm-hmm. right, but it takes mm-hmm. that amount of time for people to recognize you. Like you have to kind mm. of show, continue to show up and then people recognize you and are interested in your background and want to know who you are. Um, but I am appreciative that with, with Jeffrey, Jeffrey's always had a public presence and has been very um, supportive in me doing projects like Clay Pop that does bring attention to the work that I'm doing. No, thank you. Thank you for asking that. Um, you know, before I ask my last couple of questions, um, one, I want to find out, speaking speaking of your online presence, where can people connect with you? And could you let us know about the date of that book release? Yes. So you can connect with me on Instagram. I'd never post, but I do look at Instagram <laughs> multiple times a day. <laughs> um, I will post. So you're post, one of those. You're one of those. I am one of those. Yeah. I'm a, an Instagram lurker in that mm-hmm. I will look at other stories and shows, but I do not post. I will post on my story sometimes, but my Instagram handle is Aliyah Chisanya. And then the book will be released April 14th. So we're doing a book launch at Rizzoli's Bookstore in Flatiron on April 14th. And we'll do, we'll have a nice panel discussion, but um, that's when the book will be available. So definitely buy a copy and tell all of your friends about it. Amazing. Well, Aliyah, first of all, I just want to thank you for hopping on um, and also just acknowledge this incredible work that you're doing at teaching at Sotheby's, you know, working, you. you know, at Jeffrey and just really being a representation, right? Like being a voice on the inside. Um for other artists of color to actually be seen and be mm. seen and recognized in their full humanity. That is something that the art world has lacked for quite a while. And I know there are an incredible group of Black women specifically who are working um, yes. in the gallery space. Um, you all even have a group, you know, Entre New. So, yeah. you know, just thank you all for doing that work. You all are completely shifting um, not only the art market, but like the art historical canon, right? Like this is kind yeah. of what it's about. Who gets remembered in this mm-hmm. time? Who gets to be the voice of this time? And you and your colleagues are doing all of that incredible work. And I just want to thank you. Um, and um, hope hopefully you know open t- if anyone wants to reach out with questions right because I I yeah. obviously don't have all the questions or all the answers but you know to reach out send a DM yeah, just if they want to know a little bit more um, so if you had everything at your behest right mm-hmm. you there was no limitations what is the world that you imagine for the future. I would just imagine a world where there's space for all artists to present their work Mm. and to Mm. for people to see their work I do think that that's where Instagram is a valuable tool Um, but sometimes I I feel like being in in the art world in New York it can seem very small and it can seem like there's only in quotes there's only a certain amount of artists that are quote unquote the best, or there are only this many galleries that are the best again in quotes. But in reality, there are hundreds and thousands of artists working out there all day, every day. And there are hundreds and thousands of galleries in more places than just New York, LA and and London and Hong Kong. So I would hope that there's a, a world in which there's enough space for everyone to participate and for everyone to be able to enjoy art. And also speaking of enjoy art, there's less and fewer and fewer barriers for people to enjoy, enjoy art. That's what I loved about a show like clay pop or this, uh, another exhibition that we have in Los Angeles right now for Feek Anadol. And that we aren't, we're attracting both the art, the art crowd or the, um, the art community but we're also attracting everyday people that just want to know what's going on and are mm-hmm. interested and uh, curious, um, a little nervous as to how to enter into this world. But that's another wonderful thing about working at a gallery is that you can be an entry point 
for someone who has no understanding of how the art world works or the art ecosystem, but you are that first doorway that they walk through in their understanding and participation in the world. So I just want everyone to be able to enjoy work and not think that it's something that is that you need to have a master's degree to understand. Everyone mm. can enjoy the work and there's enough work out there um, for everyone to enjoy. Mm. Um, now, normally that's the last question, but I do have a coda. I just have one last. Like, yeah. You know, in what ways can the art world become more egalitarian. You know, I think a lot of this conversation has has, has actually really highlighted the kind of uh, strat, you know, the um, the kind of hierarchical and maybe seemingly like elitist closed door nature of the art world. Mm-hmm. But like, you know, now being in it, right, and in that space, what are those like small moments of like I, I, we don't need a list or anything but like a small small intervention small innovation that would actually bring art to the street yeah i i mean i will say and galleries are just galleries remaining open to the public and that they are free and open to the public and when people call um reminding them of that because there's so many people who don't know that galleries are free and open to the public. Yeah. It's a very basic thing, but continuing to advertise that, um, I, when it's possible having public programming. So inviting, we try to invite school groups or have panels that are also free and open to the public. But I think what I've seen with some of these exhibitions like clay pop is the impact that social media will have in, in advertising and um, just continuing to get people to come and see the work because the more you see work, the more you understand it, the more you determine what you like and what you don't like. So there is a huge impact that people will have from just literally coming inside of a gallery and making the time to come inside. So that's what I mm. really try um, to emphasize. Mm, mm, I mean, even no, it's, it's so funny. Well, just one more thing, just walking around in, no. in Soho. So we have, it's not like we're in Chelsea where people are coming there specifically to see galleries. People are walking and shopping and eating at restaurants in Soho. And I still see people walk past our window and look inside, but be too scared to walk in. Or they'll ring the doorbell and ask it or call um, and ask like, hey, can I come in? Like, what's going on in here? What, like, do you need tickets? So even like in, in Soho, Jeffrey's been in the same building since almost like 1996, 1997. And people still ask, can I come in? Do I need to buy a ticket? So just can, it, there's still a lot of work to be done in letting people know that this is an opportunity for you to participate in the art world without having to buy a ticket or to make a reservation. Just show up. Yeah, no, no, I, I, I agree. I mean, even myself, like I was shocked, right? Oh, oh my God! Oh, the door opens, right? Like you can yeah. hold the handle, yeah. you know, and yeah. the door opens, and I can in, walk no one's in. Kick you out. There's no list. There's no VIP list. It's just, just walk right in. Yeah, and not to start a whole, entirely different, you know, conversation, but you know, I'm, I'm very much keen, and 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 even here at the institute about the ways in which design actually is designing mm. us, right? That design is actually, it, that within design, um, these images of not, are not benign, right? You know, mm-hmm. the design of an art gallery is actually not benign. The exterior design of an art gallery or a museum is not benign. Yeah. It is actually designed to create question, right? To create um, a a sense of separation. And this is not on you or me, obviously, but historically these spaces, right? You go in white walls, stark, like it does Mm -hmm. not look warm. It does not look inviting. And so what are the ways in which, you know, design itself, architecture, interior design is actually already pre-signaling to people that this is not a space for you, Right. Mm. You know, words like vernissage, right? Like things mm. like these kind of shibboleths, these these kind of insider 
um, yeah. phrases and frames are designed. They, they are on purpose. It is not by happenstance that they exist in this way. They are meant to create this sense of separation and hierarchy, you know, and class. And that's something yeah. we didn't really tap on here as well. You know, the way, the ways in which um, class and class structure plays out in the art world um, yeah. and, and also it's historically, right, that have kept people of color outside of this space. You I mean, you mentioned even something like having, you know, small salaries, like who can, who can survive in New York on $35,000 a year, $40,000 a year. It's the same mm-hmm. thing that happened in magazines, right? Because in fashion mm-hmm. magazines, these were organizations that were not built around, you know, working class, everyday people. These were people no. who didn't really need the job. It was something to be doing yeah. on the side. And exactly. so that is why it looks the way that it looks and it stayed the way that it stays. But yeah. I have full faith Um in the ability for us, you and I, our colleagues, to begin to democratize the art world a bit more because we encounter it every day. We encounter it in, you know, the way our grandmother lays out the table, you know, or, um, you know, the craft that your aunt is doing. So, um, Aaliyah, thank you so much for sparking this, a new kind of t- t- mm. kind of conversation here on the Institute. And this has been so incredibly helpful. Have a this wonderful day. Been, I appreciate yeah. you, thank you so, so much. Thank you so much, Dario. This is great. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Of course, of course. Now, we are all for experimentation over here at the IBI. Was this helpful? What other subjects would you like a deep dive into? Let us know over on Instagram and Twitter at Black Imagination, or, you know, just straight up email us at info at blackimagination.org. This is a community of call and response, of co-creation at its best. Oh, and while you're typing, you can go ahead and leave us a review over on Apple Podcast, which is so helpful. Also, have you been to IBI Digital yet? Pull out your phone and type the URL blackimagination.com. There we have not only episodes, but books, articles, projects from around the world. We're more than a podcast, by the way. Knowledge is meant to be shared, not hoarded. Let's keep the energy flowing. Stay curious and keep dreaming.